Okay, well, since I saw the thing trigger on the website, I'm going to assume that we're live. Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Moonhawk Studios Presents, now on the channel Fragments of Silicon. I am your host, Mac Paladin, and with me in the studio is my good friend, Adam. Guess who's on time this week? <laughs> yeah. Or close to it. Yeah. <laughs> well, I mean, you're actually introing the show this week, so... Right. Last week I had technical difficulties. Yes, we'll yes. We'll call it that. <laughs> yeah. I was actually here on time last week, but I couldn't do anything about it. <laughs> right. <laughs> we got Kevin in the hizzy. Now 100% Comcast free. Woo! Betty Fan is here. Things are wet in the garage. I wish that would go. Uh, I was going to say pending garage leakage. <laughs> I still need to send you guys photos of what's going on in my bedroom and bathroom right now. Didn't you it already is do that? Not good. I think uh, it is happening stuff. again. Did you not see the text? No. Uh, I'll explain it. I'll explain it briefly in my news section. We'll we'll, we'll move on. And we have a petty fan. <laughs> All right. Well, and there's also the other, the other not petty fan. <laughs> I have to say, indefinite article there. Ah, uh, sorry, I'm a moron. Galix is here because I'm a moron, apparently. I'm the one who has the definite article. <laughs> <laughs> right, your first name is the. <laughs> As I'm over here eating cat treats instead of Cheetos. <laughs> we allegedly have a great show for you tonight, if my brain can, decides to function at some point. Uh, but uh, before we get to the interview and all that stuff, let's cover the news. Adam, what's cooking? I mean, should we be concerned? Uh, anyway, uh, let's see. So I guess the first bit of news is... I, I do not call the bondulence. I am not having a strong... <laughs> No. Anyway, um, fragments Yet. of silicon is charting new territory uh, and testing out mm. not necessarily new. Well, I'm like we did our first reaction video tonight, like oh, which is basically the modern name for uh, riffing, like right, yeah. You know, and turns out the technology is much Stitch better now. Incoming. <laughs> yeah. Um, the technology on Discord is much better than when you and I did it uh, yes. a while back, Mac. Or, uh, well, Penny as long as the video is on YouTube, at least. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. So the ultimate point is that's a much more viable thing now. Yeah. Mm. Um, you know, in mm. case we need to fill a leak, I'm like, um, and, uh, let's see in personal news, uh, let's, um, my brother has, uh, finally finished moving out of his old place. Um, so that's done. He just needs to find a new place. So... Uh, that means he's he and his family are kind of using my domicile as a way station during the weekend, which is um, an adventure, an adventure I never wanted to go on, but you know here we are. You know, uh, hopefully it's not too long before he finds new digs. But, you know, that's kind of up to, let's say, the markets, among other factors. Like, uh, uh, in gaming news, uh, picked up a whole bunch of electronic art titles that are, I suppose we can call them vintage. Oh. In light of what I just posted in in uh, in private business in the last few days, that is an ironic that is an ironic purchase. <laughs> I suppose, but you know, um, we'll, we'll discuss that more later. 
I'm like that showed up on a Friday, and uh, I'm like, and they were all pretty cheap. Like, uh, I think the the entire run of seventeen games is like thirty, forty bucks, uh, uh, especially with everything on sale right now. Like, right. Uh, anyway, that's my news for the week. Kevin, you're up. All right. All right. Well, we do. Well, as I as noted at the top of the show, um, I news other than just simply because of the AMC, and that is I'm officially a member of the Army of Cord Cutters. As uh, this week, we officially dropped Xfinity, aka Comcast, because it was basically a hundred and like almost two hundred dollars a month for internet and television. Mm. And we decided to Welcome to my life. Down to, yes. And instead we slimmed down to uh, YouTube TV for uh, television purposes and for internet AT&T fiber, which will save us basically about $100, $120 a month, which is a lot. Mm-hmm. So, so yeah, we're officially no longer a uh, cable <laughs> home, which uh, is going to be really strange to get used to, but you know, here we are, and here we are in a time in which uh, you have to choose. So here we are. Mm. And I do have one. Had- I do have one quick interruption for the show. We are on season seventeen, not season fifteen. Fuck. All right. <laughs> but yeah, other than uh, <laughs> other than uh, you know, weekends at the AMC. Uh, that's all for me. So, Petty, what's going on in your world? Apparently, I can't count. Aside from changing the title of the show. <laughs> it's to be updated. Yeah, he had the episode number wrong earlier, so he probably changed both of them. Yes. It said 1515, so yes. My bad. I see it on my, I see it on my desktop. I just noticed it because I flipped over to the app. Yeah. Good your... <laughs> I was like, son of a... Huh? Good your Petty. <laughs> yep. Um, so You're doing I, a great job. So I guess for the most part, everything was going okay until this Monday. Um, <laughs> apparently, we had a water leak. It we thought in the garage, which we knew there was a slight water leak that we were going to get around to fixing. And then Monday morning, we woke up to our um, water company auto. We auto pay our water bill, and it was four hundred dollars. We went to look in the garage to see what the hell, because obviously, if it's in the house, we would know. Especially a, a water <laughs> leak that bad. So we went over uh, to the garage sh- and found the supply line that comes in from off the street burst so there is now water gushing in the bottom of our garage luckily it is going into a drain at least so you know we don't worry about the entire garage flooding so and it's all it's all just concrete <laughs> like, floor. Like, be like a cartoon be like a warner brothers cartoon you know back when they had those still uh when you open the door and all of a sudden a flood just comes out on you yeah <laughs> Well, like that's because apparently it's been leaking for almost a month. But we've we've not had a reason to go over to the oh, garage. Oh, great! Well, like the the quote unquote bad leak apparently, but it's like we've had no reason to go over to the the downstairs of the garage because we thought it was just a light trickle, and then we wake up to a five hundred dollar water bill and we're like, what the hell? And yeah, it turns out the supply line has broken, so. Tomorrow morning, we have a plumber coming, that and hopefully he can fix it. Because if we can't, we have no way to get water for our pool we want to get this summer. And we already put $3,000 down on that. Oh, boy. So if they have to cut and cap the line because the damage is too extensive, we're going to need to talk to the pool guy and see how much of that money we can get back. Which, I mean, it's unfortunate because we were looking forward to getting a pool. But, you know, if you can't get water for it, 
kind of sucks. So, yeah, that's been taking up most of my mental faculties this week. Um, and, yeah. I guess next. The Gollics. Uh, I guess that's me. Um, not too much going on now. My parents are taking a short trip, so I'm in charge of the house for a little bit, so that's... Should be should be relatively uneventful, but we'll see how it goes. Um, uh, video game wise, I've mostly been playing Splatoon three because there's the side order thing, which I have finished, but nowhere near completed because it's run based. So I, I've gotten to the point where I can get to the end reasonably reliably, at least as long as I don't turn all the power ups off. Um. Which you can do to get more rewards, allegedly. Hmm. But that is, uh, that is, um, dependent on actually doing well. <clears throat> um, so that's been fun, but still doing some of the other modes too, because doing side order doesn't advance the uh, catalog at all, so. Um,. And, uh, I think that may just be about, may just about be it. Not a very eventful week. All right. Well, I was, uh, I'm in the continuing saga of listening to Jackhammers in E minor. <laughs> uh, the ongoing saga of the uh, bedroom that is now a sauna. So on February 9th, I, uh, I noticed that there was a, a wee bit of a hot water leak in underneath my master bedroom. Called emergency number. They came in and jackhammered out the floor at 9 o'clock in the morning and uh, found the water leak and put a clamp on it. Subsequently, the, uh, the concrete people used the broken concrete to fill in the hole and re-damage the line. Concrete dries. Flooring people come in and put down epoxy and, uh, and vinyl flooring. And on March 9th, a little less than a month later, because we, had, we just had February, a little less than 30 days later, poof, I am on the phone with my friend Nathan from San Diego, and I walk into the bedroom to inspect my handiwork on painting the walls, and guess what? There is a dome of hot water, and I'm like, oh boy. either that's a slime from Dragon Warrior, or I have a new <laughs> leak. Oh boy. <laughs> I'm touching the floor and it's going bloop, bloop, bloop. and it's hot as fucking hell in that room because 155 degree plus water is leaking out from a hole three and a half feet in the ground and bubbling up to the surface through cracks in the concrete. Mm. So the next day they come in and uh, jackhammer out the floor and determine this time that the concrete people are morons and they want to fill it in themselves this time. <laughs> because the concrete people decided to take chunks of old concrete and throw it directly on top of a old copper pipe. Causing the latest accident. So they replaced the entire line, which means this time they dug a 20-foot trench from the main line in my backyard all the way to the toilet in my master bathroom. Going under a load-bearing wall, no less. <laughs> um, this was a two-day job for them to first dig out the trench and then put in all of the new piping, which allegedly is done. I took a look at it, and I'm like, oh, 
they're using what looks like silicone piping this time. So it's flexible and malleable, <laughs> which are not the same thing. <laughs> malleable means that you can actually apply pressure to it and it won't damage it. <coughs> Whereas flexible simply means it's bendy, with no guarantee as to its malleability. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. since we're on definitions of words today. So there's another, so they have to redo the shower again. They have to reinstall the toilet. They have to reconcrete the bathroom and redo all of the vinyl and remove all of this dirt and concrete from the bedroom before I can start attempting to move in again as well as finish my paint job or quite possibly redo all of it so I'm broadcasting from my phone on a different channel indefinitely <laughs> uh, we do still play paladins on uh, on Fridays that's that's been working out for us. The machine that actually runs all of my retro games and stuff is still packed in my closet. And that's why we haven't been able to return to Langrisser or City of Heroes or any of that. Actually, Shadows Mist has been away uh, doing con season for much of the time. And I asked her Monday uh, what she was thinking. And she says... Not happening, Ace. Uh, I am exhausted. And I said, okay, well, that's okay, because my room is uh, under six feet of water again. <laughs> so she said groovy, or something to that effect. And uh, we moved on. So instead, I'm working very, very, very hard to get a lot of different things for uh, future streams. Not the least of which is I am attempting to get a wall-mounted 12-in-1 arcade unit from 1UP um, that has Pac-Man and a bunch of other Namco games in it. And I'm also trying to get these, uh, these what are called briefcase arcade machines off of Timu because I want to sort of add a... What's the best way to put this? A comfy element. I've actually got a strategy where I'm at, where I'm going to simulcast on uh, Twitch and on TikTok. And in order to accomplish that, I will actually have a, I have a uh, USB C to HDMI adapter currently attached to my phone, allowing me to use my uh, Plantronics headset and charge my uh, phone at the same time. That phone is on five G. So as long as I connect and disconnect and reconnect three or four times, then Discord will cooperate. <laughs> um, and then that will that phone will transmit to TikTok, but I'm actually going to have a capture window of it on my Twitch stream. Which won't take up any extra bandwidth because it'll be on its own thing, simply broadcasting the image to my desktop computer. And I'm also going to talk to Verizon, speaking of cutting the cord, Kevin. Um, <laughs> uh, I have Verizon's uh, 5G home internet, and uh, it's actually really good on download speeds. I have way, way above the national average. National average for Verizon's current 5G service is about 94 megabits down and 1.19 up. And I have... 241 down and about 4.5 to 6.5 up on a variable basis. And I'm going to contact them and see what they can do about getting me eight or better on the upload. Download is fine. I can download anything I want at breakneck speed. And honestly, based on the speeds of most other servers and such based, you know, because of traffic and all that good stuff. Um, even if you had Gigablast or Fiber, you're not going to get that significant of an increase in speed in downloads because it's hampered by the source. Um, so, like I said, I'm doing good there. I just need to get them to figure out how to unlock this this uh, upload speed because asynchronicity sucks. 
and I can't get fiber in my apartment, and I definitely can't go back to Cox Cable anytime soon. Um, for reasons that will become evident as time marches on. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I'm, so I'm trying to get a whole bunch of stuff ready for the room, so once I'm done with all of this rebuilding of my entire bedroom and bathroom fiasco i can move all my stuff back and rebuild it as uh, because both of the bedrooms are now streaming rooms they are they are studios set up for different purposes um the uh the bedroom that is currently defunct is going to be for uh retro gaming and we'll call it comfy style gaming and vtubing and then in here, I play my more hardcore stuff because I have the much higher end hardware in this room. I have my Ryzen 7 sitting right here. I have my Ryzen 5 with my SLI graphics array and my 144 hertz monitor, uh, my LG Ultra Gaming Series monitor, my 4K monitors here. And I've got a really good setup for things like Paladins and Overwatch and Call of Duty and all that good stuff. So that way, you know, when I get more serious about my whole FPS shenanigans thing, I'll, I have a, a station dedicated to that purpose. Um, so that's basically it. So at some point, I'm going to be uh, putting a, I'm going to be, uh, I'm going to be putting up a new link to coffee. So people can, uh, and a running tab on my Timu shopping cart. Because I, you know, apparently everybody who's on Timu just keeps loading things indefinitely into their shopping cart and then buying it when they can afford it. <laughs> um, like I've, I've been reading on the Reddit page for Timu that some people have uh, upwards of a hundred plus items in their shopping cart. <laughs> and then they just wait for items to fall off as they either become unavailable or uh, drop significantly in price before they purchase. So um, I haven't put the arcade consoles in there yet, but I'm going to set up like an arcade corner in the retro gaming room. And I'm pretty excited about that, but I've got anime figures. I've got wall scrolls. I've got, Aluminum signs. I just picked up a bunch of new accent lighting uh, at the thrift store that was on sale. Um, so I'm ready to start rebuilding whenever the apartment complex gets their asses around to it. And this ends up being a month long saga every time I try to get something done with these guys. So uh, to be continued. But without any further ado, I think we're going to get to our guest and let's uh, let's get this going. So that way. Uh, we can give him the maximum benefit, and Petty Fan can duck out so that way he can deal with his leaky garage <laughs> tomorrow morning. Tonight on the program, we have Wells Thompson of Mecha Ton and more, uh, writer of Mecha Ton, Frankenstein, The Unconquered, and The Cat Skin and the Rose, and a walking, exhausted Miyazaki meme. Correct. Wells, welcome to the show. <laughs> yeah, thanks for having me. So give us a brief rundown of the of the main bullet points I just covered there. What what is it all about and and what are you trying to accomplish? And then I'm going to unleash Adam on you to get to the nuts and bolts. Sure. Um I think at this point I'm I'm trying to make myself as unsummarizable as possible. Uh I <laughs> I do everything I can to work in every genre possible so that uh, I'm, I'm not easy to for, for a single audience to attract. And that's purely... Uh, will, yeah. I, I think I hate myself. I don't know. Um, no, I... I uh, it will not be pigeonholed. <laughs> I'm 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 interested in, in storytelling and I'm very interested in uh, sort of the, the uh, different... Uh, I, I, I like exploring characters and I like exploring uh, uh, different scenarios. And, and that very often has me hopping from, uh, from, from project to project and genre to genre. So Mechaton, as you said, uh, is, is sort of my flagship project that I've been working on for a little while. We just put out our trade volume for that. Um, that is an all ages uh, uh, sci-fi uh, action comedy, kind of in the vein of like an old Toonami cartoon. Think like Scott Pilgrim meets Pacific Rim. Um, mm -hmm. 
Wow, um, now that's a hell of a combination. <laughs> right? <laughs> yeah, it's about a glove that turns anything it punches into a mech. It's it's awesome. Uh, and then, on the other hand, Frankenstein <laughs> the Unconquered is... And yes, we will just leave it there. Uh, Frankenstein the Unconquered is... Uh, we'll, we'll, call it, we'll call it the Mecha Midas Touch. Exactly. Um, Frankenstein the Unconquered is sort of a, a unofficial sequel to Mary Shelley's novel that takes place 500 years in the future in a post-apocalypse where everything is bombed out and broken and looks a lot more like the monster does. Uh, so it's his chance to sort of live a normal life and he absolutely blows it. Um, and then uh, on, on the other hand, the, the project I'm working on right now that I'm, I'm just uh, announced to the world is called Smut. Uh, so I, I truly, there is no one genre that I can be contained to. And that is uh, not to my benefit. <laughs> I fear. <laughs> mm. You're, you're talking to the you're talking to the guy who has ten different web comics, at least six of which are smut under his belt. Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. I mean, so trust me, also, I empathize. <laughs> also, not that unusual Adam? on the indie comic scene to sure. have somebody who's working on multiple things at once. Yeah, no doubt. Well, it's I always feel it, like there's... it's always quantity over quality because we have to constantly grind. Right. Yeah, and it, it is it is sort of a constant, uh, you know, uh, uh, trying to get stuff out there and trying to, uh, be just because of the nature of it, like, we're not running a big production studio, we don't have multiple artists working on stuff, so, like, everything kind of gets made a lot slower than your, like, regular monthly production schedule, uh, so it, it, you know, for for me, it made a lot of sense to try and jump into multiple uh, sort of things at the same time. Um, mm -hmm. You know that that might <laughs> maybe that was an oversight, but <laughs> on on uh, mm -hmm. but you know, I I really uh, I really enjoy what I do. I, I really like uh, uh, being able to tell stories in this manner, and uh, yeah, I think it's I, yeah. I, 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 I love being able to bring new stuff and enough currently enough people uh, like what I do that I'm able to keep doing it. So I'm, I'm just hoping to keep that going for as long as I can. See, now that is mood right there, <laughs> especially for me. I'm watching my world melt down around me and, and trying and saying to myself, my creations, my babies. <laughs> All right, well, let's uh, let's get right down to the nuts and bolts, uh, Adam. Right, so I suppose my first question is, uh, do you have any sort of background in comic books work previous to what you're doing now? Like, have you worked in the industry for a long time or anything of that nature? N no, uh, I... I wanted to be like, I, I initially started writing, wanting to be uh, a novelist and a short story writer and then a screenwriter at some point uh, in college. Uh, that, that's what I studied was screenwriting. And it was uh, my friend and writing partner, Dalton uh, sort of turned me on to comics. Not that I ha obviously, you know, we I would grew up aware of comics. I just didn't read a ton of them. I was never, I never really got hooked on like Spider-Man and Batman the way a lot of people do when they're young. Uh, mm -hmm. It was a lot more, you know, I, the, the comics I got hooked on in high school and college were like Scott Pilgrim versus the world. Uh, uh, Watchmen, uh, uh, per you know, uh, Persepolis, uh, 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 Craig Thompson's blankets, like big, heavy graphic novels were mostly what I was doing, and obviously, whatever Scott Pilgrim is, um, which I love dearly. I'm not saying that as an insult, it's great. Um, but yeah, I, I, I wasn't really into like the monthly, you know, uh, comics, uh, bit, uh, for much of my sort of. Uh, young life, and then I, I fell into it as a consequence of uh, wanting to get stuff published and finding that uh, novels and, and screenwriting is very gatekeepy and it's it's difficult to break through. Um, and I was like, I can spend another seven years trying to get the same novel published, or I can start making comics right now. So I started making comics right now. 
and it's been really nice. I, I love and and yeah, as I've as I've done that, I've grown more acclimated to the space. I've read a lot more, and I've really fallen in love with the format. I love comics like as a medium, uh, and I would stay here regardless if I could get a if I could get a novel publishing deal tomorrow. I'd still be making comics. I mean, that's always handy um, mm. to enjoy the thing that you do. I'm assuming that you do this part time. Uh, currently, this is my uh, I'm I'm throwing myself into it as as full time as I can. Um, for for the last couple of years, I've been well. For the last ten years, I've been serving tables. For the last couple of years, I've been using uh, uh, serving tables as a way of kind of supplementing uh, uh, making comics, and I'm uh, doing everything I can. Uh, I had a I had a foot injury that took me out of uh, serving tables uh, temporarily, and while I have recovered from that, um, I'm sort of uh, doing everything I can to try and make this uh, my full time job, so that I don't have to split my time anymore. I can just focus on making the books. Hmm. Well, I, yeah, I, I'm I'm a driver, so I know. <laughs> All about that hustle. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Almost yeah, everyone no. in comics has a has a has a second gig, or a fir- or this is their second gig. <laughs> One or the I, other. I, I mean, it's doesn't it seem like all creatives are either waiting tables or driving a cab? <laughs> it depends. Um, on, it de- more or less, it depends on the field. Like, yeah, comic books definitely. Uh, let's say video games. We got a lot of people who are in that uh, full time. Well, I mean, they talk about the five percent of Hollywood that represents the other, you know, that that outshines the other ninety-five percent who are just struggling to live day to day. You know, I mean, because five percent of the people in Hollywood are getting ninety-five percent of the work, right? But the comic book, like comic books, doesn't even have that in it, right? Like, you know, even if you're doing Marvel and DC stuff. You're more likely than not uh, still uh, maybe having trouble paying the bills, from what I understand. Mm. I mean, it's, it's certainly it's, more security, but really, you have to be really flexible and really multifaceted. I think I, I current in the current environment, and that's sort of the tricky thing about comics is that like the, the environment changes rapidly and without warning. But in the current environment, I think it is possible to do well and and make like a nice living for yourself but it it involves a lot of uh a lot of self-publishing know-how which is tough in the best of times um yeah i I was i was gonna say that i was gonna say the department of labor also has a difficult time classifying what we consider standards of living because of the fact that you know, they're basing it on on traditional employment values that don't really exist anymore. Hell yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, the 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 difficulty in like explaining to someone uh, that no, you actually can't just walk up to Marvel and get a job uh, anymore. <laughs> I I remember yeah. I was at Dragon Con. Uh, this was I don't know a year and a half, so two years ago, I guess. Um, and uh, it was it was a a panel about breaking into comics, and it was and forgive me, I don't remember the names, but it was all people who broke in in like the seventies and eighties. So it was just these, you know, it was a lot of fun listening to you know old guys swapping stories. But it was a lot of like, well, I got an internship, I moved to New York and brought my portfolio, got an internship at Marvel, and uh, they swapped me over to DC when they didn't have any work going on. We're like, okay, so that's never gonna happen. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, portfolio reviews at San Diego Comic Con are not a thing anymore. <laughs> no, not at all. Uh, all right. But yeah, I, I currently am. I, I, don't get me wrong. Would love if if an editor emailed me tomorrow to say, "Hey, we want you to write Spider Gwen." I would immediately <laughs> drop everything I'm doing to do that. But <laughs> mm-hmm. currently, not not what I'm uh, not what I'm seeking, and not what I'm like uh, judging my success on. It's it's a right, lot more right. what I can bring to you know my audience, a small number of people who uh, are nonetheless very like enthusiastic about my work and uh, and and see the value in it and growing that as much as possible. 
I always tell people, there's like my parents are 76 and 77 respectively. And so I always tell them, I always tell them that I try to explain my work as though I were explaining it to Joe Biden or Donald Trump. <laughs> <laughs> I dumb it down to that level because <laughs> it's way too complicated <laughs> to explain the hustle to somebody who has never endured. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a unique kind of stress. Uh, and luckily my wife has good enough health care that I can afford a therapist. So it's <laughs> working out so far. <laughs> hey man, brother. All right. Back to Adam. Let me, let me get, we'll get this back on track. Sorry about that. I just, I just wanted to add that little bit of color there. Really <laughs> noted. Uh, I suppose it would be worth asking, like what aspect of comic books do you personally handle? So I'm a writer, uh, which means I do everything except the important things. Um, I, I, I create the story, I write the script, uh, and I'm also uh, a project manager. So I, I you know, gather everyone together, finance the project, and uh, fund it on uh, Kickstarter um, is, is generally where I uh, go. Um, yeah, it's... It's a lot. It's a lot of work for for work that is sometimes kind of invisible. Like what I do, as far as the comic goes, is not something that has, like it's it's evident in the reading of it, but it's not something that you would point to and say, "Oh, the writer did that." Um, which, which is something I do genuinely love about comics is the collaborative nature of it. Um, but often it's hard to, when people are like, what do you do? I'm like, well, it's more than just dialogue, but I couldn't point to it and say that's it. Uh, yeah, and, and, and aside from that, I am a freelance editor as well. I do uh, edit other people's work um, and, and make sure their stories are ah. as good as possible. So I, I try and tackle just storytelling in general from a non-artistic point of view, is what I would say. <laughs> I do. <laughs> I, I got to interject one more time here. This is this is almost like if Adam was interviewing me without the <laughs> self-aggrandization on my part. <laughs> Hell yeah! Because because I totally understand this struggle. I told I told everybody last week that I was actually looking forward to this interview. You know, letting Adam get the esoteric details down pat, but being able to throw in all of this color from my own experience because everything you are doing is so relatable to me. That's awesome. Yeah, no. It's, yeah, because I've been doing it for the last twenty five years. <laughs> I cannot even imagine. Yeah, I've been doing it. I think now for about five years. Like, if I go back and look at my tax documents, it probably goes back to yeah, like 2018, 2019. So about five years I've been doing this, um, and uh, already it's just like it's been so fulfilling, and also I'm losing hair. <laughs> <laughs> like it's it's just both at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right once again let's keep going I'm, I'm sure uh, yes yeah. anyway so do you work with the same team for all the projects or do you like work with different people for you know Frankenstein the Unconquered versus Megaton and uh, so on and so forth so there's there's like a familiar cast of characters in in some regard i work with the same uh I, I work with the same co-writer on a lot of my projects dalton shannon he's a good friend he got me into comics he's a brilliant storyteller um so for we we co-write uh mechaton and frankenstein the unconquered um i have kind of a, a small handful of uh letters that i work with um if you know, uh, if I'm not co-writing a book, I'll, I'll use the same editor, uh, Krista Harader. She, uh, they are fantastic. Um, same with the designer. Uh, if there's any writers listening, I, I, any project managers listening, I want to advise you: uh, find a designer, make them your best friend, because they make your life a million times easier. Um, <laughs> having someone reliable to do all of my graphic design is easily the biggest quality of life change uh, I've ever experienced. But in terms of the, the art, uh, the colors, uh, the, generally I work with, with very different teams, uh, both because 
I want to match different styles to those different projects. And because on a practical level, it doesn't make a lot of sense for me to assign the same artist two books at the same time. You, they can only draw one page at a time. Unless they're really talented and like ambidextrous and can be sketching things with two hands, that would be incredible. But for the most part, uh, one artist is going to work on one thing at a time. So it to in order to like maintain a schedule and and always be working on something it it becomes necessary to work with different creative teams. That makes sense. And I'm presuming so, like you're working on multiple things at once. Yeah. I am always working on like the thing that needs to be like fulfilled that we've already uh funded and are, and are just working on full time. Uh, I'm working on the thing that, uh, you know, it needs to be funded right now. And I'm also working on the thing that we're going to be funding in the future. So at, at any given point in time, I'm always working on at least three projects. Um, as far as writing goes, it's, it's very strange because I like my creative work kind of ends long before it, it ever comes to fruition. Uh, you know, I, the, the the take what I'm doing right now. Uh, like I said, I'm I'm working on a book called Smut. Um, it's a uh, uh, slice of life uh, erotica, and uh, I wrote the entire script for all three issues in probably uh, April or May of last year. Uh, and I've wanted, I knew that I wanted to like bring it out as quickly as possible. And this is just legitimately as quickly as I could, I could get it to like a state where it's, it's presentable. Uh, so the stuff that I'm working on now is stuff that I will not be able to like present for, you know, the next year or two. Uh, but I am always, you know, working really hard and 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 writing and editing and and trying to make my projects as good as possible. Uh, even as uh, I know that it's going to be a while before we get to them. I mean, once again, that is very logical given the time constraints and everything that you have to work with. Yeah, it's also I'll say a double edged sword because in my mind. I've put out so much more than I actually have, <laughs> you know, in, in, it took me a minute to, to go back and say, Oh, people haven't seen the fur the full first arc of Mechaton. They've only seen the first two issues and they haven't seen, you know, uh, what I'm doing really with Frankenstein, the unconquered. They've only seen like issue one. Um, and that can get really, you know, that, that can be difficult to, uh, sort of get used to is the idea that like, you're you're wor you've been working on something for so long but no one has seen it yet. <laughs> hmm. Does that present any sort of issue when like communicating on a new Kickstarter? I would I, I don't think so at this point. I think I've established I hope I've established enough trust with people. Uh we're yeah, we're working on our 11th Kickstarter. Uh, we're fulfilling our 10th right now. We do have two more that we're working on uh, that are that are sort of in the pipeline. One is a very large project, and one is uh, one that unfortunately got delayed because uh, our uh, uh, Elizabeth McKenzie, uh, our artist, uh, broke her hand. <laughs> so we had to, yeah, we had to delay that uh, in order to to allow her time to heal and rehabilitate. Um, but I, I, you know, we fulfilled however many six, seven projects uh, fully, and uh, we are, you know, we're we we're always as good as we can about communicating and uh, do everything we can to assure people that, like, yeah, we're we're serious about we're, we're about doing this. So not not to be. Not to be morbid, but I, I'm glad you got your artist back. My last artist on Starship Moonhawk was taken by COVID. Oh, I'm so sorry to hear that. That's terrible. Yeah, uh, yeah, that's been an on, that's been an ongoing narrative on this channel. Oof. Yeah, that uh, I'm, I'm so glad I haven't run into that. There, there was a brief period in in 2020 where 
uh, when we were working on our very first project, uh, an anthology called Descent into Dread, uh, which is horror based, obviously. But uh, one of our one of our uh, artists was Italian, and he just he went completely uh, ghosted for like three months, and we were like, "Is he? Is he okay?" <laughs> He eventually came back right. and finished the project, but yeah, we were we were really worried for a second. Um, yeah, I'm, I, that that really sucks. I'm sorry to hear. Yeah, yeah, and and the worst is we saw it coming too because she made an announcement she was going into the hospital about a month before her her uh, her TO came on Facebook and gave, delivered yeah. the bad news, and I'm like, I haven't heard from her in a while. Oh. Yeah, that's all. That's, that's never the way you want to find out. Um, and and certainly, uh, it, it's it's always sort of a you know, uh, comics as a whole is is it carries an inherent amount of risk just from like you rely yeah. so much on other people, and that is a beautiful thing. It creates a strong community. Uh, you know, indie comics. I can say I've I've made some of my best friends in indie comics, but at the same time you know, putting that much trust in people leaves you really vulnerable. And it is, you know, uh, no, no matter how it goes, like anytime and anytime an artist, uh, drops out of your life, it's like very painful and, and requires a lot of, uh, of, of work to kind of rebuild that, uh, both with your, yeah. and like, you know, the next time you go look for an artist, you're, you're a little bit paranoid. <laughs> Of what right, and, and what I wanted, to, yeah, and what I wanted to connect the dots with here is that even even though I have a, a bit longer of experience on this than than you do, what's amazing about this is how beat by beat you're describing things that have happened very similarly to me, and that the whole experience of being an indie creator is such a shared experience because we all go through roughly the same trials and tribulations. It's wild, and I honestly wish there was more kind of public information about it, because so much of it is trial and error and trying to to find your own way. Uh, and yet, well, and and there and there is an element of uh, of of sabotage from the uh, from the base of power, from the powers that be in the in the corpro side of things. Uh, you know, whether you're looking at VTubing, uh, I'm watching the whole Niji Sanji, uh, EN self-destruction and, and then, you know, the indie comic scene is, is trying to effectively supplant, um, uh, you know, we're basically trying to fill the void because corpo comics are basically, you know, self-destructing <laughs> as we speak. Uh, you know, and that's an ongoing process. I, I think, I think comics in general are trying to follow a certain, like, follow a certain, like, follow a certain trend that makes them, uh, uniquely vulnerable. Well, not maybe not uniquely, but vulnerable to, uh, you know, VCs and, and greedy people taking advantage of the situation and stripping it for parts, which is what we're seeing with, mm -hmm. uh, you know, certain publishers that I, I won't mention. Uh, that, you know, uh, There's not a lot of them left, so... You know, <laughs> elbow, elbow. elbow, elbow. <laughs> I actually, you know, one I will mention because it's it's ancient enough history now that we can, you know, all talk about it uh, without fear. or with. And I never had any workings with them anyway, was uh, Action Lab. They just, they, they did everything wrong and uh, <laughs> sort of... I, you know, I'm not going to be as dramatic as to say gave, you know, stained any comics or anything like that, but it's definitely a wake up call to indie creators to like really be careful who you work with. Cause if you're, there are, yeah. indie, there are, there are small up and coming indie presses that are, you know, d trying to do things right. And, and are just like struggling with capital. And then there's people that are, cause it's a hard business to get into. And then there are those that are just like treating it like an IP farm that the only thing they want to do is get properties and try and like make a TV show out of them and generate their money that way. And don't really care about the comic side of things. And it's pretty, it's not always easy to, to tell the difference, especially when it's like your first book that you're putting out. 
Yeah. And, and of course, then you also have situations like, you know, uh, you get somebody who is either uh, legendarily skilled or literally legendary, like uh, like uh, the late Akira Toriyama. Uh, uh, you know, the, the, it is truly a human experience, you know, that when we're when we're we get lucky for that lightning rod moment. The, and we and you know you you get that you get that taste of greatness and then to have it snatched away you know it's it's just sorry didn't mean to get morbid but <laughs> <laughs> you know as i as i turn 47 you know and i'm entering my 25th year in in this whole thing like this is this is sort of this show today is sort of like an anniversary event for me indirectly so i i, I apologize i'm not trying to steal any thunder or anything like that it's just no, i'm fine. waxing nostalgic as we speak right now <laughs> <laughs> no i mean this, this, I is, this that... is hitting all the right buttons for me yeah yeah <laughs> Yeah, Toriyama all the notes for me. Like, massively influential. Uh, if you got the chance to read Mechaton, then it's not a secret that we were influenced by Dragon Ball Z and by you know the the kind of like mind. Mm-hmm. Um, I think I didn't know, bring that up for no reason. I didn't yeah. bring that up for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I yeah. mean like yeah, the, the the art style is very is not you know strictly like. A anime but is definitely you know manga inspired um and and we were sort we were definitely influenced by that like midnight run tsunami kind of uh <laughs> kind of uh, uh generational impact uh so yeah as, as a single creator absolutely left a massive impact and uh you know i think he uh, the the sad thing is he lived uh, a much longer li- and and probably easier life than a lot of uh people in his position uh uh right I, I forget his name the 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 guy who did berserk um died tragically young uh just because working conditions are are terrible for for you know comic creators in general but mangaka in specific uh, yeah, bo- yeah, both 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 Japan and the U.S. have uh, terrible problems with the uh, working conditions and industries in their in their. It's just it's completely different. Terrible. Yeah, it's it's a different expectation, but it's still a terrible expectation. Uh-huh. Uh huh. Well, I mean, even in animation, you know, we talked last week about the late lamented Rooster Teeth, and and you know, one of the founding members of that one of the people who really put them on the map you know outside of red versus blue was monty ohm and of course you know uh, a tragic uh mishap during surgery took him from us at age 38 mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. so you know it's it's life is funny that's all i can say anyway adam back to the serious and not dreary stuff please <laughs> like well i'm not sure if this particular subject matter uh, contrasts from that because um, Frankenstein the Unconquered um, mm. yes. it, like you did send me a couple of your uh, comics uh, you know I read uh, the first chapter of this and um, dreary is a good term for it like not in a bad way it's just you know it's a very you know it's a post apocalyptic uh adventure if you will starring um Frankenstein's uh golem of flesh indeed and yeah. I'm wondering what possessed you to want to do the Disney thing if you will you know tell a <laughs> I'm just that is very funny that uh, uh, a... <laughs> uh, uh, Am I wrong? <laughs> no, I mean, just like the, the, the concept of Frankenstein the Unconquered is so sort of inherently uh, violent and, and in some ways ghoulish that, uh, that uh, it's, it's funny to hear it described as the Disney thing. Um, but... I mean, no, but, it does but, have a cranky... It does have a, cr- it does have a kind of cranky hunchback of Notre Dame. <laughs> A little sure. <laughs> I don't think the punch that I've ever uh, punched uh, punched a hole through someone's lungs, but um, no. The, the idea was well, you know, that's the cranky part. 
Sure. Yeah. Very cranky. Um, the I, I'll 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 give credit where it's due. Uh, the initial idea was not mine. It was it was my uh, writing partner Dalton's. Uh, he he he's a huge fan, and as am I. But him even more so is a huge fan of of uh, like Universal horror monsters and that sort of uh, uh, era of uh, of the movie monster and and the, the horror film. And uh, I. You know, I, I what I saw in it was this is a really interesting and unique exploration of like, uh, you know, uh, uh, toxic masculinity and and sort of uh, a a different <laughs> approach. I've I've always been a uh, a more like literary focused writer. Um, my my area of study, uh, other than screenwriting, was was like. Uh, English literature, uh, and and one of the uh, classes I took in college was uh, uh, film and lit uh, horror. So we read Frankenstein, we read Dracula, we watched uh, the movies that they were adapted from, and uh, it's a really fascinating book. Uh, and there's a lot of relevant themes to take from it, but I do feel like the under discussed element is sort of the is is that is is toxic masculinity. Even in, you know, uh, in the eighteen hundreds, was still like, extremely present as a, I, as a I, book. I, I um, think you, I think you hit it right on the head because I mean, if we, if you, if you do an, a basic analysis of Mary Shelley's Frankenstein, Mary Shelley wrote that book at the age of nineteen mm -hmm. while she was on a uh, sexual slash romantic getaway tryst weekend with her lover and his significant other. <laughs> Right. And she wanted to write that book instead because of a little contest that they were holding. So, I mean, you want to talk about you want to talk about being right on the nose. <laughs> and uh, yeah. notably, uh, both Shelley and Lord Byron are both uh, d big personalities. Oh, absolutely. Mm. And, yes. and so yes. much of That's so much not, of Victor, not Mary, but her, her so much of Victor whatever. Frankenstein is is sort of modeled after Percy Shelley, uh, which is interesting in its own right. But just even putting that aside, just the act of uh, you know certain things about the book, like the, uh, the the way Victor kind of treats Elizabeth uh, as not even really a person. Like it's very clear in his narration, he, 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 you know, has affection for her, but it, she is presented to him as like I think the quote is from his mother is a pretty little gift. Um, when the when he faces the monster for the you know after destroying the bride uh, that he's supposed to create for him, he says, "I'll be with you on your wedding night," and never wants to see think, "Oh, my wife might be in danger." It is all about him one hundred percent of the time, um, and I think that you know the, both the drive to prove yourself and the sort of disregard for other people is a core part of Victor's journey in the novel, but also the monster's journey as a reflection of Victor. Uh, and that was something mm. I really wanted to explore, you know, further in, in this uh, book. Uh, it's also, let's be clear, uh, just a really fun time. <laughs> it's, it's a lot of fun to bring in the wolf man and, uh, and, and the invisible mm. man and, and uh, Dr. Jekyll and Mr. Hyde and just have like a universal horror monster throwdown. Um, and that was always sort of the, um, you know, not the overall intention necessarily of, of the book was just to do that, but that was sort of the, uh, that would be a lot of, you know, aesthetically, that's, that's the thing that we're like, it'd be a lot of fun to just have Frankenstein with a broadsword fighting, uh, horror monsters. And we sort of built on top of that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, you hear that and you can't help but feel, but go hell yeah. Um, <laughs> so yeah, I mean, I'm like, <laughs> nice. <laughs> At least on no, the surface, but you know, if you don't do it right, you get well the dark universe. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. This is I I do remember kind of pitching it that way at first. Is like this is what the dark universe should have been. Um, <laughs> this is instead of that awful mummy movie that we got. Like this is what we should. Oh. Have been. Um, 
and yeah, we're we're working on uh, issues. We're we're drawing issues three and four right now. Those were funded, uh, and uh, we'll we'll hopefully be uh, going for issue five later this year. Mm. But yeah, it's it's that's that's always been a that's a project that uh, I I like a lot because it sort of pulls on everything that I like <laughs> about storytelling from the classical side of things, from the heavy thematic side of things, and from just the heavy metal, you know, let's let's throw down, let's do some nonsense uh, uh, kind of uh, 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 way of doing things. Makes sense. Anyway, um, so pressing forward to what could be the diametric opposite to Frankenstein the Unconquered, we got the cat skin in the roads. Hell yeah. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So <sighs> that, that got that's a uh, book that got funded uh last year. Uh it's a graphic novella, uh, uh around 70 pages. Uh I'm working on it right now with uh Rachel Disler. She's a phenomenal uh uh artist and and part and creative partner uh and it is it, it's it's princess bride with uh like what am i thinking with uh elements of like uh, uh revolutionary girl lieutenant it's it's sapphic as hell it's about uh you know falling in love uh in the middle of a duel um and it was sort of born out of uh, there was a an anthology uh, a couple of years ago, uh, uh, short a sharp wit in the company of women that I, you know, I, I wanted to write a uh, uh, a short story and uh, uh, for that anthology, um, and it was supposed to be four pages, and I, I started writing it, and it just grew and grew and grew, and I, I couldn't contain it to four pages, so it became its own thing. Um, and yeah, it's 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 a book that I absolutely love. I think it's my it's it's up there with one of my favorite things I've ever written for sure, and uh, I really can't wait for it to be done. <laughs> Um, well, I suppose it uh, it's worth asking, what is the stage of production with the cat skin and the rose right now? Uh, we're working on uh, line art at the moment. Uh, well, line, yeah, we're, we're working on uh, a considerable amount of line art as well as colors, uh, which Rachel is, is handling both. Uh, we haven't really started uh, the lettering process yet, but we're, we're hoping to get on that. Uh, according to Rachel's production schedule... Uh, should be done in the first half of this year. So here's hoping uh, that by, you know, uh, Fan Expo Chicago and uh, New York Comic Con, it can be on the table for people to enjoy. Hmm. And trying to figure out what is the proper way to phrase this. Like, as this is something that could, um, you know, approach with a certain amount of sensitivity, but I'm assuming you are a heterosexual cis male. Yes, indeed. Yeah. <laughs> so I, oh, God. Uh, I, I think he, please, yeah. please don't let this be filthy February. <laughs> no, no, no. But it's more. I coined one of the worst expressions in the history of this podcast in that 2011 faithful interview. So why do you? So let's just get that out of the way. Huh? So why do you? I'm saying I'm. I. hmm? You sound mad, dude. (laughs) I was bringing it up. (laughs) I was bringing it up so we don't have a repeat. (laughs) Yeah, that's why I'm approaching this with caution. Like, Indeed. but you know, the base, you know, um, it is something that you, uh, you know, it's not the first time it's come up, but it, you know, it's always something that, you know, does need to be inquired about because, you know, how did you approach a LGBTQ plus romance? Right. You know, with, 
you know, no, uh, I mean, what, part, what, of what, it, part of it is that I have, I've sort of grown up in community with, uh, a lot of LGBTQ people. Uh, and I don't just mean like I have a gay friend. I mean, like my, I grew up with, uh, uh, a man who, uh, contracted HIV in the eighties and somehow managed to survive into the 2020s. Um, and my, uh, my wife is bisexual. I've always had uh, uh, queer friends. I've always been more comfortable in that community than I have necessarily in like strictly heterosexual community. That doesn't make me like, you know, f- a, a representative of, of that uh, community by any means. Mm-hmm. I'm not like a member of that. I'm at best an ally. Uh, that said, I, I, it's, it's never been a stretch for me to write queer characters because they're who I interact with every day. Um, also, you have excellent, you have excellent role models, so this is not succumbing yeah. to prurient interest. Exactly. It wasn't my, my, which is always, which never, is always the concern. My intent was never mm-hmm. to like exploit a, you know, a subculture. It was to write a story about the people that I know and love. Um, on top of everything, I also Perfect. take great pains to make sure that like the people I'm wor- like, I can't help the fact that I'm straight and white, uh, <laughs> but I can, you know, when I, when I work on books that have, uh, queer characters and characters of color. I, I take great pains to make sure that those people are also reflected on, in the creative team and in the creative process. Um, Ra- you know, Rachel has did a great job. Um, you, if uh, acting as sort of a second editor, I, I you know, and and giving a lot of uh, feedback to the to the script uh, while we were sort of working it out mm-hmm. before we started working on anything. Um, and as well as uh, my editor, uh, Krista Harader, Knowledgeable Cabbage, uh, is uh, queer and non-binary, and uh, yeah, was not afraid to voice her opinion or voice their opinion uh, whenever you know uh, need, needed to. And I've I've never I've luckily never had any issues where people you know the, the people that I've worked with have said, "Hey, this is this is way out of line." Um, mm-hmm. I'm, I feel I'm, I'm, you know, partially I feel like I'm very lucky in that regard, but also partially that's just me. I, I ever, whenever I'm writing, I am constantly checking, like, you know, my perspective and and uh, you know, level of awareness and making sure that like I'm not unintentionally delving into territory I have no business being in. Um. Well, but, yeah, I'll, I'll take some of the pressure off of you on this one. So I'll take some of the pressure off of this one. The key to good allyship is is elevating marginalized voices rather than drowning them out. And it sounds like you've got that pretty well nailed down. And, I, and I, of I, course, I, the uh, yeah, you know. So as as you know, it sounds like it sounds like you take that as as a point of pride too, and which is which is very good because uh, there's a there's a fantastic expression that I heard many, many years ago, is that we have two ears and but one mouth, and we should listen twice as much as we speak. Sure. And I think, I think, I think good allyship is all about that, and it sounds like you're on the right track with all that, so. I as a perspective, that. as the perspective, as the perspective of, of, of uh, yours truly, the bisexual host of this show. Sure. And uh, and I don't want to speak for for Kevin or anybody else on the on the program who are uh, also openly part of the Alphabet Mafia. Yeah, uh, I, unless you have something to say, Kevin. Please. I think Kevin went to sleep. Kevin notably <laughs> silent. <laughs> no, indeed. I, it's it's something that I I you know I'm not gonna say I struggle with I because I, I, I it was really just a, a decision I made a long time ago of I'm you know it, it, if I don't have a good reason why this character needs to be you know uh, straight and white and and more or less you know uh, talk and act like me then I I do everything I can to make it as different as possible. 
Um, and part of that is challenging myself as a writer, and part of that is there's enough stories about straight white dudes, and I'm tired of reading them, so I can only imagine that my audience is mm-hmm. also tired of reading them. And I don't, you know, if I, if I can do something different than I want to, and if I can make people feel seen, then that's even better. Um, and for the most part, I feel like I've, I've done a, a good job um, in, I, I, I was part partially I was really worried about uh doing like a, a strict, you know, queer romance kind of story. And this is like some mm-hmm. like apples and oranges, but um uh I I felt better about it when a, a friend of mine who's a middle school teacher uh started bringing uh Mechaton, the the individual issues to uh her uh, uh classroom. And one of the students, one of the characters in the book, if 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 you're unaware, is uh, non-binary, uh, and in 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 a queer relationship with a with a woman, and uh, one of the students in her uh, uh, class was like, I didn't have the words to to say what I was, but I want to be like Hex, um, and I felt really cool about that. Like I felt. Uh, uh, middle schooler kind of figure out their identity. That's awesome. That's good, especially Indeed. in the times we're living in. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. It, like, I should I should also point out this was in Tennessee, <laughs> so the the books ooh. unfortunately <laughs> the the books unfortunately had to leave the classroom shortly thereafter, but. <laughs> I, I definitely, uh, you know, that there were a couple of yeah. that felt you know, pretty good about seeing that kind of thing uh, represented in a comic. So, um, yeah, I I haven't personally gotten uh, a lot of pushback for the like substance that I've put out, and I, f- you know, feel really good about that. Hmm. I mean, uh, that's good at the very least. Like. <laughs> Uh, anyway, so can you articulate the creative spark that you had that moved this from a anthology short story to a full blown novella? Like, what um, aspect that really caught you to make this into a full blown production? Let's say, I, you know, the thing is, I can identify the exact line of thought. Uh, that led us to to say, oh, th- there's more here. This we can we can make this into a whole series. Unfortunately, it's a massive spoiler. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah, no, there, there. When we realized uh, what the ultimate in, we, we sort of extrapolated like in the world of Frankenstein: The Unconquered. What is Frank's, which is our shorthand for the monster? Uh, what is Frank's ultimate? you know, goal, what, where does he end up in all this? Uh, and we went, well, this might happen. And suddenly we were like, oh, we're doing this. Yeah, that's too good. That's way too good to pass up. <laughs> um, so it, it, it partially it was just we knew we had more to say, but identify, having a really clear, identifiable, like, this is what's going to happen uh, sparked us to make it a priority and, and really start working on it. Intriguing. I'm like, I hope to learn more. You, I'll say this: you'll learn more about what I'm ta- what I'm hinting at in issue mm-hmm. five. So once issue five hits Kickstarter and and gets made and comes out, uh, hopefully by the end of this year, fingers crossed. Uh, yeah, I think I think some of those some of these vagaries will be a lot more clear. Uh, duly noted. Um, Speaking of Kickstarter, um, you've mentioned it a couple times uh, throughout the interview, but this is probably a good place to focus on the upcoming Kickstarter for Smut. Smut, yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah, it's a, uh, a slice of life uh, comedy, very not safe for work, about uh, three <laughs> friends trying to sort of sort out their very messy love lives. Um, and it's sort of presented in a vignette style. The first issue is is Dakota, one character who is uh, going on a first date and 
uh, has resolved not to sleep with the guy right away because that's sort of been her go-to cop out for like, I don't know where I want this to go. So it's just going to be a one night stand and I don't have to deal with it anymore. Uh, but then runs into the problem of he's actually someone she kind of wants to stick around for. Uh, and yeah, that, it, that one's a ton of fun. Ton of fun. Uh, Dakota herself is like a uh, personal trainer and, and a little bit jacked and sort of the, um, the the visual of her being taller and a lot stronger than him and him not having a problem with that was a lot of fun to work with. Uh, the second one is about uh, uh, her friend Jess and the third one is about Rita and they have... I'll, uh, they have their own problems. Uh, Jess trying to adjust to an adju- to a an existing relationship dynamic, and uh, Rita trying to uh, either break up with her boyfriend or learn how to uh, talk with him uh, without completely melting down. <laughs> so, uh, it's a lot of fun. It's very uh, it it's. Uh, it, yeah, it's weird for me to say it's sexy without feeling gross, but it like it's it's meant to be uh, fun and sexy and and uh, and I I yeah I'm sorry. <laughs> this, this is a new series for me and a new genre for me to stick my toes in, but it's I. Uh, I, we we sort of uh, headed into it with the idea that like we didn't want to make a strictly cheesecake series that's just a you know a, sort of a, a bog standard plot where someone you know gets naked every now and then. It's it's a book that is about uh, sex and relationships and communication and trust and uses those factors to tell the story. Mm. Now, are you concerned about the potential backer slash audience maybe mistaking this series for that, given the title you picked out? Uh, no, that was the point. Uh, I mean, well, it, it's not that I, it's not that we thought that people would, like, we were worried that people would mistake it for, uh, you know, uh, uh, sort of cheesecake with nothing to offer. It's that we wanted people who, who, who would buy it as though it was cheesecake with nothing to offer to then read it and be surprised that there's a genuine story underneath it all. Hmm. And then our audience who knows us to, to go into it knowing that there's a really, you know, smut is a, is a tongue-in-cheek title uh, and we're definitely advertising what it is, but we're also, there's, there's going to be more to it than just, uh, than just cheeky fun. Interesting. And is this Kickstarter for all three issues? Uh, we're just doing the first issue for this uh, first Kickstarter. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, 32 pages for the first one. The the, the other two will be, uh, I believe, 20 and 22, respectively. And when do you think this is going to go live? April 8th. Mm. I am, so, I've been I've very prepared for this one. I've been waiting for this one for a while. <laughs> I mean, how many Kickstarters do you tend to do in a year? Uh, depending. Uh, I'm hoping to do at least four Kickstarters this year, hopefully five. Mm. That is and if quite I can, a... And if I can do more, I would love to do more. I'm always in a position where I, I want to be able to push harder and, and go further into it. It's just, you know, do I have the, uh, the security and the, uh, the audience to be able to go further into this without relying on, you know, working a second job? Or <laughs> Also, like, the work on one not being enough to get in the way of... Exactly, yeah. I don't want to... for another. I don't want to trip over, you know, my own projects and and not be able to make one because I'm focused on, you know, making another or pushing another. Uh, at the same time, you know, every every project has downtime and and production periods and. Uh, oh yeah. Yeah. So so it's it's trying to find the the rhythm uh, is is really the game. I suppose most of the, I was going to make a joke about a Kickstarter project that uh like 
seismically overstepped its promises with stretch goals, but most of the examples of that I can think of are video games and not for sure. Comics. Not a uh, written material. Yeah, we try and keep our stretch goals very like still worth going for, but very like reasonable. Um, you know, the extra prints and and uh, new edition, like different, maybe a new cover or, or a yeah, new, we'll, uh, we'll put spot gloss yeah. on the cover. It'll have exactly, a yeah, something like that. Something that <laughs> we we know that we can achieve without like massively, you know, uh, overinflating our budget or, uh, for that matter, like no Kickstarter, off. Kickstarter exclusive. Uh, if you reach this stretch goal, uh, I'll do an entire extra chapter about such and such of a character backstory that I haven't written yet. <laughs> I would, I think, <laughs> for, I think for the trade, I would love to do like an eight page short. That's just a sort of fun idea that we had that didn't fit into to any of the, well, yeah, but you uh, plan for it ahead of time and don't do it just because someone exactly. paid you an additional, yeah, yeah, yeah. additional $10,000 over what you thought you needed. Right. <laughs> uh, yeah, the, the the sort of planning production and, and making sure that things are achievable is is really important. Uh, and yeah, that's that's uh, where I'm... That I've definitely learned to do that uh, and, and, you know, offer things that... Uh, don't require too much, for example, extra shipping material, because that can easily eat up your budget. Yeah, that's another one. International shipping is a bitch these days, still. Yeah, international shipping is terrible. <laughs> and I feel bad for, for uh, my international backers, because they generally have to wait a long time, and it's it's very expensive. So we, we usually wind up signing uh, all international, uh, or and, and maybe even giving some extra like add-ons to international backers, just to make it worth it. Oh boy! Like, uh, anyway. So, what's the goal you're looking at here? Uh, so our our funding goal is eight thousand dollars. Uh, and that is mostly paying for uh the the art and covers and whatnot. Uh, taking care of the creative team is is the most important thing there. As well as I think that covers most of the printing run. If we were just to hit that like minimum, it would it would cover pretty much yeah that much the printing run and the uh, the art. And then the rest of it is just uh, I I always have a minimum amount that I'm like you know willing to to pay out just to see the project made. So makes sense. Like. And, um, well, I suppose, you know, best of luck to you with, uh, the Smut Kickstarter. Well, I appreciate that. <laughs> yeah, it's, uh, it's one that I'm really excited about. It's a lot, it's, uh, it's, it's been a, it's been a pleasure working with this creative team. Uh, Bianca Milanes is the, uh, main artist. DC Hopkins is the letterer. Uh, they're both fantastic and professional and, and I, I can't wait to get to make the rest of the book. Indeed. And um, once again, we wish for your success. So, um, right. So I've run through my gamut of questions. I will turn it to the field here to see if there's anything else that wish to be asked. I think I've spoken up. But I had I'm something. Good. Yeah, I uh, I definitely had something, and it was uh, and and it was in there. <laughs> <laughs> Delightfully awkward. Welcome to welcome to Moonhawk Studios presents Post I Am Your Mac Pallet. <laughs> oh man. Uh as always, I finish with uh do you have any appearances or anything that you wish to uh be on the Kickstarter that uh you wish to promote that you'll be using as part of your promotional tour to get people on board with the whole Kickstarter thing? Ooh. So I don't know. I, I will be at C2E2, uh, not as a, uh, a tabling artist, unfortunately, but I, I will be there as a professional um, to network and to talk to people. And I, I've been considering making a lanyard or a T-shirt that says, ask me about my smut. Um, so if you see that, uh, please feel free to approach me and I will uh, tell you all about it. Um, other than that, I intend to be uh, at a, a local comic shop in Chicago uh, some uh, during a free comic book day. 
uh, as well as I believe uh, Lafayette Comic Con is coming up, and I, I intend to go there. Which is a small Comic Con. All right. But. <laughs> all right. Well, that all sounds great. Um, well, it was wonderful talking to you. Uh, you are welcome to, of course, stay with us and uh, during our entertainment segment at the end here, uh, if you wish to uh, commentate on the latest things happening in the industry. Um, and we definitely need to keep in touch so that way we can, uh, when some of this stuff uh, comes out on the newsstand, such as it is, uh, uh, we could do sort of a, a, a post-mortem follow-up, as they say in the industry. <laughs> <laughs> For sure, for sure. I'd love to stick around. Unfortunately, uh, it is past my cat's feeding time, and they will start screaming at me if I don't get up to feed them. So. Oh, yeah. Tippy, Tippy was just doing that to me, so I, I know all about that. <laughs> See, yeah, everything, you everything you're doing is relatable. Right? No, that's my whole brand. Uh, <laughs> uh, thank you guys so much for having me on. I really appreciate it. All right. No problem, no problem. Absolutely. All right, everybody, that was uh, Wells Thompson of uh, Mechaton, Mechaton and more. Be sure to check him out on Coffee. Hold on, I'm blind and I can't read this. Uh, Coffee.com forward slash Wells Thompson. Uh, so that way you can get uh, information on the latest Kickstarters as well as being able to give individual donations outside the regular field. Now we move on to entertainment. Adam. You're in the spotlight again, my friend. Well, I mean, of course, we could start at no other place this week than addressing mm. fully the sudden and uh, rather Tragic. untimely. Uh, yeah, I'm like, uh, just out of the blue, Akira Toriyama uh, is dead, you know, at the age of 68. Like, I was reading from I was reading from one of his one of his assistants or handlers um, that he he might have been actually struggling with health problems for some time and was doing so quietly. It it, it wouldn't be surprising because yeah. um, what he was going like we didn't even know he was dead until a week later. Yeah, until a week well, after he died. Yeah, he, di he died on the first. Yeah, he died on yeah. March 1st, and they announced it a week later. But oh, wow. Apparently, oh, wow. apparently, after the funeral and burial was done and over with, so... Which, yeah. this somewhat was understandable, all... he was... They, if the family wanted to have anything remotely resembling small. They wanted privacy, and, uh, yeah. well, you're talking about, you know, we're talking about here... <laughs> um, you need to keep this a dead secret if you want that. So yeah, the the best the best way to ensure a uh, a small ceremony for someone like that is to literally not tell anyone about it until afterwards. Yeah, and um, fact, um, that that was definitely the way to go here because yes, uh -huh. I'm like it has been quite a while since we've had such a a death like this, yeah. Of pub culture uh, die on us. I, I mean, there have been a f there have been a few, but I mean, this is almost as big as when Tezuka passed in '89. Yeah, Toriyama has right. gotten uh, memorial messages posted uh, publicly on Twitter and in other ways from uh, the leaders of most of the countries in Latin America. Yes, this, I, is you a, know, it, this, this literally is a death that is close to a the death of a monarch. In Latin America, without question. Yeah, and, and what's interesting about this whole thing, you know, I mean, I I could easily if if this information had gotten out sooner, I could easily have seen this turning into a Ferengi funeral. And if, and if you don't know what that means, people trying to buy pieces of the late, the dearly departed. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, yeah, I uh, yeah. I mean, maybe, but I don't think so because of no, the fact that he died in Japan. But yeah, I mean. It, 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 it's on the level. So, yeah, yeah. The point. The the point is, um, like I said, uh, the last time we had a beloved creative die 
you know, who touched this many people was probably Stan Lee. You want to say? Stan, I, was, I would I was say that Stan. would that the, considering the because that's that's the thing. It's not like he just did, or rather, even if you even if it was just Dragon Ball, uh, the amount of stuff that has been. Oh no doubt. Based in some way on that I mean, spin, on his works is ridiculous. Chrono Trigger, Chrono Cross, mm. no, the entire that's like, Dragon Quest, the entire things. Dragon Quest series. You know, yeah, so he's it's the like, character. He was the character yeah. designer for the most popular he is, JRPG he is series. Codex. He he is literally the codex for our modern lexicon of of anime and and video games. Like probably the closest in recent. Another close one recent time would probably be Kazuka Takahashi, the creator of Yu-Gi-Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's on mm. that level. Mm-hmm. Kind of, yeah. except for Yugi still had Super Saiyan hair. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like <laughs> I know what you mean. Pretty close to like modern card gaming is now. Like the yeah. the 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 next the next big one that would have similar impact would be at the inevitable point when Miyazaki passes. Um, I'm like Zaki no, there, there, there's an, I'm like from the manga world. I'll tell you exactly who the next one is: Miko Takahashi, or maybe Oda. I'm like, I don't think he's as old as Takahashi is. Fair, but uh, no, but but the, um, just a legacy Oda, of One Piece. Yeah, Oda smokes. Yeah, and has had been hospitalized that before. Yeah. Like th- there's a reason why he has instructions to like, his assistant. So, yeah, I yeah, but I mean, I mean, both literally and metaphorically, though Miyazaki is the Walt Disney of Japan. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, both of <laughs> yeah. them would be a national event. Their death would be a national event in Japan. Um, yeah, yeah, and but in terms of like a global event, I think yeah, Miyazaki would be one. Any of the big, any of the three or four big jump creators, I could should also put Togashi in there. Yeah. If yeah. something were to happen to him, what, yes, yeah. he, they have health heart, health issues, but the de- death would still be a sh- would be, you know, it's still a shock when it happens. Yeah, like, yeah. You went or like, you speak, it, it wouldn't be surprising, but it still would be shocking when it actually happens. That oh my god, he's actually dead. Mm-hmm. Yeah, like or Shigeru Miyamoto. Oh yeah, yeah, him too. Yeah, but you know, or yeah, or, uh, so yeah. Uh, uh, anyway, Akira Toriyama yeah, has quite the body of work, but you know, I don't think anyone would deny you know the thing that he is known for is Dragon Ball. I mean, mm-hmm. but it's truly astounding how deep the reverence for the property has been because I mean, you even know, th- Dragon Ball is an enormous land of contrasts far beyond the normal joking limitations of p- things being called that. Well, this, this is a man, though, that, that has defined such a unique artistic style that his students are going to be attempting to replicate his work well into the future. Right, because he does... He, he was really good at badass uh, shonen posing and stuff. He was also really good at ga- gag character designs. And yeah. he was really good at uh, the cool creatures that are unusual in various ways. And he was good at designing funky robots. <laughs> there are not many people that are good at more than like one or two of those. You're 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 gonna be you're gonna be seeing. You're seeing uh, I'm sorry, there was an echo there. You're gonna be seeing a lot of. Um, I think you're gonna be seeing the ghost of his work. Continuing on in the pens of his, in the pens and pencils of his students for many, many years to come. Like, like there will be no sh- shortage of Akira Toriyama style artwork I mean, coming out of Japan for the foreseeable future. Students, nothing. I'm like the <laughs> the influence that Dragon Ball has had is is pretty incalculable. Oh yeah, like. Yeah. <sighs> I mean, literally anybody anybody who follows in his footsteps, I I am I'm labeling under the largesse of student. So keep that in mind. I'm not. Okay, not I'm not just li- not just literal people. Right. With him. 
Yeah. People, yeah. people who have I'm studied his work and are trying to imitate his style, you know? Not just even talking about, like, students or, you know, like, you will get Dragon Ball references in, you know, all sorts of things. But I'm talking about the visual language. I'm not talking yeah. uh, the actual visual style, not just references to it, but actually imitating his work for continuity purposes. Right, but uh, I mm-hmm. mean, his work has been referenced as far flung as, say, uh, the WWE. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Indeed. Yeah. yeah. The, the New Day, looking at you guys. Uh huh. Like. His work is too big. His his work is too big to die. It's going to be like Star Trek, you know, where it, it continues on long after the death of the creator. I think. Uh-huh. Oh yeah. Think people the, are go- the the trick will be how good the people who are tasked with creating new characters in any of that work. How well how well that'll. You know, I, mean, I foresee I'm a great sure. disturbance in the force here because there's there's going to be a lot of people who are saying they're going to be saying, well, I mean, it's a Toriyama type character. It's not a it's not really his creation, you know, I and mean, that's going to create I'm, some friction. <laughs> I mean, I'm I'm pretty sure that he's put out he's he had he had put together a basically a layout of the overall situation, especially considering that the the manga essentially right now is being done by somebody else. Yeah. So, right. I'm and pretty somebody sure. who's, um, he's he's, yeah, he's been ascended. Though? He's been ascended to a supervisory position for a long time. It's not like he's sitting there penning all of the stuff himself all the time. You know, mm-hmm. that wasn't yeah, that was that wasn't the thing. I mean, the acolytes are already moving forward. Right. Well, I mean, they've been doing that since arguably 1997. Um, yeah. Right. When Dragon Ball GT hit the scene, which was you know the first. Dragon Ball property that Toriyama was only a uh, uh, not a consultant but a contributor to. Uh, you know, yeah, like he, Char- he, he characters he, by <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, like he contributed some designs and stuff like that, but he had nothing to do with the narrative. Um, and he came back to a bit of an active role in some of the stuff, if I remember correctly, after uh, the fiasco that was Dragon Ball Evolution. For you know, right? But he's ne- he, he, yeah, he, oh. he's never gone back to the day to day grind for right. obvious no. reasons, right? Like you know, because that is its own um, hell. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you know, it's like. Believe like it, it, it's a wonder that he made it out without you know any sort of grievous injury, which yeah. is more well, than a lot of mangaka yeah. can say. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I will say on a personal. I will say on a personal note, the the passing of Akira Toriyama is very personal to me because it reminds me that the the pendulum of time stops swinging for no one. Uh, myself included, and so you know the setbacks and reboots that I've experienced myself. Um, this kind of this this when someone like this passes, it drives home the the importance of putting pen to paper and getting stuff done. Yeah, Indeed, because because there, you don't I'm know sure. how mu- you never know how much time you have left. Uh huh. Yep. When, like um, when I was doing the Dragon Ball Z Kakarot stream on Friday, Ogre mentioned to me that Toriyama is the reason why Naka draws. If right. it wasn't for Toriyama, fragments probably wouldn't exist. Me and Golix probably wouldn't be here. <laughs> mm-hmm. You know, so it's a weird connection, but yeah, uh... butterfly effects a hell of a drug. Yeah, mm-hmm. like, but yeah, like. There's, we could do a singular show yeah. Yeah. about Akira Toriyama that could go six hours. I was about to say singular yeah. show, oh, yeah. cute friend. We could probably <laughs> do a few. Yeah, yeah. We could probably do a couple of seasons here. We could probably do a couple of seasons easy. <laughs> Hell, yeah. because, like, season we haven't we even had, mentioned. Uh, you know, like his, like his second most popular work, and that is Doctor Slump. Doctor Slump, mm-hmm. yeah. You know. Oh yeah. 
I'm like, granted, Dr. Slump didn't get much traction out west, let's right. say, but, right. you know, in Japan, like, huge, huge property. It was his first hit. Yeah. Yep. Like, and then there's Sandland, which is currently being pushed by Bandai Namco. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Which is so, probably what makes this thing a little bit harder to swallow, is because Sandland was about to get this big push, and there's also that other Dragon Ball series that he was pushing forward, Daima? which... Daima, yeah, yes. That, which, that was going to be on TV, which was not supposed to be originally. Yeah, it so, was originally going to be a web series that they're going to move to TV, which that's fine. Yeah. Well, and, and of course, we have to remember. That we also have to remember, as I mentioned before, his, his perpetual his perpetual relationship is basically a founding member of Enix. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, something like that. He didn't work for Enix. Um, Enix had a contributor uh, sort of a relationship with uh, developers and people. Um, it, it, well, I mean, yeah, in the old days, but I mean, he became somewhat synonymous with the brand, considering that he contributed character designs to something like fifty percent of the games <laughs> that right. they were putting out. Mm. So, you know, in order to make sure that this isn't a complete hiography, and right. also because you know nobody is perfect, um, we do have to acknowledge the you know the various mistakes that Akira Toriyama. Um, not necessarily made, but you know, sign of the times. Um, mm -hmm. You know, uh, you know. Obviously, what's going to come up most is uh, Mr. Popo. Like, yeah, I was going to say Popo, which has its own conversation in with the you know influence of the uh, I want to say the Hindu deity. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, who's sh shown up elsewhere. Not the only problem. Um, General Blue um, should be coming up a lot more because, okay, if you're not familiar with him, uh, one of the more prominent members of the Red Ribbon Army, Army, and there's no other way to put it, he's basically framed as a pedophile. Uh, <laughs> I'm like, th th this is the shit that you get in the 80s. Like, uh -huh. Uh -huh. Um, you know, and other sign of the time stuff that you'll find in Dragon Ball, yeah, you know, just uh, a lot of the stuff with uh, Bulma, um, yeah, and j just Mutin Roshi in general, yeah, is a, is a character who has not aged well. Mm -hmm. uh, no, no, no. <laughs> I no. mean, they try to rehabilitate him in Super. Uh, didn't really work. Like, you know, it's just, you're not getting uh, the fact that, you know, he's just inherently based off of some, let's say, true and tried Japanese comedy tropes. Mm -hmm. Specifically old comedy tropes. Yeah. Uh, that have to do with um, monks. Um, yeah. And shit like that. But, you know, it's it makes it no less good for him to be like doing that. yeah you know the you know the um just the pursuing of the panties and the shit like that especially yes. like in dragon ball bulma was what 12 16 oh she was 16 yeah. still definitely yeah. way too young for that bullshit definitely in a yeah. statutory range yes yeah i'm like um you know, not to mention that, yeah, he would just flat out draw an underage Bulma topless every now and again. Mm. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm like, you know, once again, uh, you know, nobody's perfect. I'm like, no. Oh. But the important thing to remember is people can change and evolve, provided that they are not utter fucking culture warrior shithead. Correct. <laughs> I was gonna say let's let's not flip the flip over. You know the pendulum swinging metaphor is, is was really coming to mind for a second there because I was like I was like are we gonna go for like equal measures of character assassination as well? No, as no. In memoriam. No, no, no. <laughs> no, no, no. no, we're not. No. Yeah, because 
No, because uh, Toriyama learned from and grew as an artist because he, in later periods of time, you know, the bad stuff has been ex excised as much as it can from uh, Dragon Ball. Um, well, and as so too has Japanese society gradually evolved as well. We have to keep that in mind that that it, that yeah. while while public sweeping changes front page news in America, it is not always so in other lands. <laughs> right, and, yeah. and more prudently, Kira Toriyama has drawn let's say it's hard to say people of color because you know different races and stuff exist in dragon ball but you know better depictions of different races and ethnicities are found in dragon ball now and you know because he ha was informed of how bad some of the racial characters were. Mm -hmm. um, it's especially important to note because, you know, yeah, as bad as um, Mr. Propo was, that's in no way um, broken the connection that uh, the black community has found with Dragon Ball. I can't really speak to that because, you know, we're, uh, I don't think anyone here can speak to that because, you know, we're a bunch of white people. Like, yeah. but I do know it exists. Like, mm -hmm. um, like it's the not the only crap who we had on earlier this season was obviously a big fan of Toriyama. Yeah. Among other people. I mean, because... you know, he's, he's one of those creatives though, that, that lived long enough that started far back enough that we have to understand that that the mindset of the mangaka throughout the seventies, the eighties, and the nineties, right, wasn't the same as it would be in la later on. Like because, um, conversely, like no, Toriyama was not a admirer of Hitler. Um, just to smack that stupid yeah. piece of urban r rumorage uh, down even more. I'm like, I, I don't think it comes up too much these days, but it, it was definitely a thing in early internet culture. Let's say, mm -hmm. like, because I'm like, spoiler alert: No, Akira Toriyama would would not be a white supremacist. Like because duh, mm -hmm. but but no, you know he also wasn't fascinated with Nazi imagery like a lot of uh, mangaka. Were, some of his contemporaries were looking at you, fucking Kaneku man. <laughs> that that's that's a big reason why it never got, uh, went west in it, as Kaneku man. Mm -hmm. Not the original. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of Nazi imagery there, yeah. which is, you know, and not the only manga code who's guilty of that shit. And, I, you know, I know I've heard the excuse, oh, but they didn't know. Like, motherfuck. Like, you didn't know that Adolf Hitler and the Nazis were bad. Mm -hmm. Like, what are they teaching over there? Is my question. Hello. Did you hear any of that speech I just made? No. Nope. Uh, you um, might want okay. to give it a give it again. What was the last thing you heard, heard me say? And you're out. out. Yeah, uh -oh. you're 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 gar gar gargling again. So, uh, yeah, this is probably a good uh, spot to end it since it's also one o'clock. Mm -hmm. Yes. Hello. Hi. Hello. Am I clear? Yep. Uh, no, not really. I mean, you're better than you were. Yeah, with your goggling. Oh, and he's off again. He'll be back in just a second, folks. Okay, hopefully Matt can resolve this, because we need to conclude this. Okay, try again here. All right. Uh, no, no, no. Not clear. 
No. How about now? No. No. <laughs> uh, live broadcasting. Let's finish line, folks. Live, fo- live, 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 live uh, podcasting, folks. There ain't nothing like it. Yeah. Hello. Okay, now you're back. Better. Okay. What okay. was the last thing that you heard me say clearly before I got unceremoniously dumped off the call? Nothing. You haven't talked it's for been like a while a since minutes. you said anything. Yeah, that's the thing. Okay, yeah. so I had a whole thing when we were talking about the ethnicity of characters and representation that we have to uh, that we once again have to remind everybody that throughout the seventies, eighties, and nineties, and Toriyama was of the, of that age. Mm -hmm. That throughout the 70s, 80s, and 90s, character representation was strictly Japanese or Southeast Asian up until very, very recently. So no matter what the skin tone, eye color, or hair color of the character was, and I referenced Yoruichi from uh, from Bleach, the dark-skinned, purple-haired cat girl character, uh, as being claimed by the African-American community in America, I wanted to point out that if they have a Japanese name, then the character is Japanese in the minds of the creator, <laughs> regardless of what they look like. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, so Dragon this is a, this is actually a, seems to be not he was actually tra- aligned with our world. I would say they a lot of people just aren't any recognizable Earth and eth- Earth Earth ethnicity, and the ones that are are usually a clear trope, like Krillin being a Buddhist monk. Or right. That's more but true that was, for, but that's because uh, for Z and Super, there was a lot more of that in original Dragon Ball. Okay, that's fair. Right, but, but what I was getting at was that was emblematic of the times, and it took a while for all of the creators, even many contemporary creators, to kind of get on board with that. Mm-hmm. Right. Because because what happens in the Western world, we're very sensitive to uh, to ethnic representation uh minority representation and such and such and japan was never really concerned with what concerns the western world until very very recently right it's also japan is one of the least ethnically diverse uh, nations on the planet like, Which is interesting because uh apparently there is a response to trying to get more uh People from other countries to immigrate to Japan, huh? Uh, golden Kamui. I mean, there, there yeah. are ethnicities other than uh, you know J- the Japanese in Japan. I do want to make that clear. It's just you will not hear about them ninety nine percent of the time. Yeah, well, with the low pop, with there, this the, the only thing I was going to say is with the with the negative population growth, there has been uh, a movement starting to try to keep Westerners in Japan to sort of settle down and help with the population problem. <laughs> so you're going to mm. probably see a very different Japan in the next 20, 30, 40 years. Mm. Yes, I suppose so. Anyway, we need right, to wrap but it anyway, up. Anyway, yeah, I'm sorry that got, I'm sorry that I'm sorry that got rushed. It was because I did that whole beautiful speech about it and it was lost because nobody heard it. Uh, Not the first anyway. time that's happened. Mm-hmm. Anyway. Anyway. All sorry. right. So any last notes before uh, about general entertainment before I go to the closing? No, I think we're good. Yeah, not enough we have okay. time for, so... Okay. Alright, so... That is that. Uh, next week, of course, on the podcast, we'll have Byron O'Neill of Comic Book Yeti, the best indie comic site on the World Wide Web. Reviews, merch, and more. Adam, do you have any additional insight on that before we close out? Yeah, um, like, it's another one of these um, networks that we've okay. encountered. Um, like, uh, last season's the Spidey Dude Network. Um, oh, okay. You know, something like that, or, or Comic Book Squares. Um, same thing. We'll be talking to, uh, their podcast host or co host. Um, oh. um, okay. but they are, uh, but they also like do ha- reviews and articles on comics. You know, a lot of comic book stuff. No. I um, see. 
something definitely to look forward to. And I'm glad to I'm glad to see that we're we're keeping the uh, the diversity of things going. Um, and then Adam, uh, you and I will need to talk about that indie publisher that I I was harping on the other day. Um, uh, don't worry about it. They're booked. Oh, uh, they're on my schedule. Like, right. no. Okay then. Well, let me know. Let me know when that is, and we'll figure it out. But anyway, uh, that's it for this week's Moonhawk Studios presents, and uh, and be sure to join us next week for more partial excitement. Until then, I'm your host, Mac Paladin. Thanks for watching. Stay safe out there.